Tuesday to you. It is truly a pleasure that you have taken the time to be here with us. Today we are here again to discuss the word of God. And I know in the past that you have been blessed tremendously by the many discussions that the pastors Connor had in the past. But today we want to look at some difficult passages that many of you may have challenges with. And we today are here, you know, to give you some clarity based on what the word of God says. But before we go into our program today, I would ask you to bow your heads right where you are so that we can acknowledge the presence of the Lord with us. Father, we thank you so much for who you are and what you have done. Today you have blessed us with life once again. Had it not been for you on our side, we all would have been dead. But great is your faithfulness, for you have extended our lives once again. Today, Lord, we are about to go into your word, and we dare not go into your word without the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we pray that you will be with the panelists, even as they seek to bring clarity, clarity to your people. We pray that you would endow them with the Holy Spirit, and they will not speak on their own authority, but they will allow the Spirit of God to speak through them. We thank you for what will be done, and we thank you for those who will tune in even now and even later on in the day. We thank you for the messages that will go forth. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will give them the power to put into practice the teachings that will be taught here today in Jesus' name. So once again, I, I say good morning to you. And I really want you to take this moment to share and like the page, you know, invite someone and let them know that Pastor's Connor is on at this moment. Today we have two powerful men of God that will seek to bring clarity to us. And I want to just take this moment so that they can just introduce themselves. And I will just start at my far left, uh, uh, at, at Pastor Lambert, as he introduced you know, himself to us today. All right. Good day to everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Lambert Paul. I'm the pastor of the Western One District, um, which is Closure, Loreto, Mongrambi, and Florida. And it's a privilege for me to be with you this morning. Amen. Amen. And then we have close to me. Morning, Pastor Maxine Noel, and morning, viewers and listeners. I'm Pastor Isaac, the Ministerial Secretary of the Grenada Conference. I'm delighted to be with you, as always, and Pastor's Corner, to share the Word of God with you. Praise the Lord. Men of God, it is truly a, ple a pleasure to have you with me today. And I know that you are ready, you know, to unfold the truth that the Spirit of God had impressed upon your heart. And so, to start our discussion, I would ask this question by first starting out with the passage that is taken from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, and it reads, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Men of God, can you explain to your audience, um, does Exodus uh, chapter 20 and verse 4, forbids us from having paintings in our homes and particularly the places of worship all right well this is a very interesting scripture um we have to bear in mind as the chapter started um god was reminding the children of israel of where they came from he was saying to them that you just came from egypt and remember i am the lord thy god who have brought thee out of egypt and because of the amount of years that they have spent in egypt um they would have been they have adapted the lifestyle of Egypt to the, um, the different gods and the different images and so on. So what God was actually saying to them, I don't want you to erect those type of images and to worship them. But this is not forbidden um, having paintings or home and in our churches or in a place of worship. No, because you cannot, you, you, you can, it does not necessarily have to be a painting. It can be a vehicle. It can be a house. It can even be an individual who you give your adoration and your praise, and this, this only belongs to God. So we got to be very mindful of that, because sometimes you can have a painting, and a painting means nothing than just beautification to the place of worship or your house. But you see, the adoration, the recognition that is, that is due only to God should not be given to anyone else or anything else. Wonderful. Pastor? Yes, of course, I want to add my voice with Pastor Paul. I think he's on point there, because um, as... The question asks, many persons do believe that um, this text forbids um, us from having paintings um, 
even using paintings in PowerPoint. You know, some, sometimes you use that, you have paintings or, or you know, portrait of Jesus, and folks, folks are upset with that because they think you're going against the commandment. Well, the Bi Exodus 24 does not talk to this. Well, as Pastor Paul just said, God was um, very particular and meticulous about his children venerating. That is, giving respect to, um, you know, carve or molding or whatever it is that, that they, they, whatever object that they, that they um, form um, to take the place of God. You see, that, that's what God was interested in. Not just having a painting. No, I think verse 5 explained it. God didn't want them to, to, to have it, to venerate it, as to bow down to it make, or to deify it. See, that, that's it. You make it into a God. But today, um, as Pastor Paul said, this, this is not, um, um, we in the Western world, we don't know do much of that. And we can feel very safe. But, but I, I can say some persons apparently worship their phones. Yeah. You know, some persons worship other objects. Things that they, they think that they have spent much money for. And, and therefore, that has become a God to them. They don't kneel down and bow to it. But the way they function is as though that is a God. And I think this, this is what the text is talking about. Not literally, don't put a, a, a nice painting of something in your house. The, the, no, the Bible is not referring to that. Um, he says that in verse 4, and then verse 5 tells us about it. That you don't do it so as to bow down to it, so as to venerate it, so as to respect it, uh, making it a God. So I think that, 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 that's the command there. Yeah? Wonderful. Well put this morning. You know, it is, these men are... You know, going on into the context and the true meaning of passages and why we should do certain things and why we should not. And I really just like the idea that um, it is about function. And, and sometimes we use photos for a PowerPoint, but that's not to say that we are bowing down to it, you know. Sometimes we use an image in our home for beautification. But I just love how you guys just unfold it this morning. Additionally, Pastor, just want to, I just want to add... Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you use an a image or uh, uh, something of that nature, especially if in, in a PowerPoint presentation, because I love to preach a PowerPoint presentation. And what it does is that it helps to clarify the message, because what happens, there are different type of learners. There are those who are visual, there are those who are audible, and different things. So um, the different methods help probably to send the point home or to reach that individual who might be um, more inclined to visual aids, right? And so it's, ne it's not necessarily, okay, well, um, this, this should receive our praise and our adoration. No, it's just to make a point. It's sometimes it's just an illustration that you are using that, that picture, that image. Sometimes you even do a physical illustration. You have things on the stage and you have a cross and you have you know, different things that you use, but it doesn't mean that what is used should be worship and to praise as though it is a God. Wonderful, wonderful. I think we can move on this morning now to our second question. I'm seeing a number of persons saying good morning, you know, good morning, pastors. Well, good morning to you. And, and we just want to encourage you, you know, to continue to participate in the service by sending your comments and even your questions. And if we have time, we can take it. So good morning to each and every one of you. As we move on to our, uh, our second question, I want to move to First John chapter 5 and verse 16. And it reads, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who committed the sin, not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not see that he should pray about that. And let me ask the question, are there some sins, pastors, which will not lead one to hell based on the text? Have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very powerful question, <laughs> Pastor. Are there some sins? Well, um, you know, the prophet Ezekiel says it, um, I think it's Ezekiel 18, 26, the soul that sinneth shall die. I mean, that is, that is straightforward. There's no getting around that. The soul that sinneth shall die. And of course, the Apostle Paul in Romans six twenty three says the wages of sin is death. So when someone asks, are there some sins? I wonder which, which sins they're referring to. What, what, it is clear to me that all sins will lead to death because the soul, the soul that sin it shall die. Now, very interesting passage you, you read there um, in 1 John 5 that the Apostle John is referring to. And a surface reading, I must, I must say that a surface reading does indicate that there are some type of sin. If you commit 
that sin you wouldn't die, and uh, and, and there are some other sins you 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 know you can you can pray for and that kind of thing. Well, really, what the apostle John is referring to is not so much a type of sin because I said all sin. The Bible is very clear: all sins committed leads to death. Once, once, of course, um, the only thing that saves the sinner is a repentant sinner. So you, you sin and you're on death row. That's what it is. Yes, you sin and you're on death row. Is you're heading to hell. Now, if you seek forgiveness and you receive forgiveness from Jesus, you turn around. Yes? Um, but the sin that the Apostle John is referring to is not a type of sin. Yes? No, it's not a type of sin. It's not a kind of sin. It's referring to what we normally term the coin. The, you know, that we refer to as the unpardonable sin, which is not a type of sin. You know, adultery is a type of sin, and lying is a kind of sin, and, 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 and um, covetousness is a type of sin. The unpardonable sin is not a type of sin. It's a state of being. After you, one would have opposed, transgressed, um, refused to listen. It's a state. You have now reached a point. After rejecting the Holy Spirit, you have arrived at that point. You know, so one can wake up this morning and, and they're just telling lies and they have sin. One can wake up and, and uh, commit adultery. They can steal, I mean, you know. But one cannot just wake up and commit the unpardonable sin just like that. Yeah. No. The unpardonable sin is a, is a sin, it's a progressive kind of stuff, you know, that after not listening, you know, um, but you don't have to, you can just sin at the moment when it comes to lying or stealing. You could just sin. Yeah? But the unpardonable sin is not just like that. It's a state one would have found themselves in after continual rejection of the Holy Spirit. You know, and this is what the Apostle John is referring to. When it, 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 it sounds as though it's a, kind of, it's a type of sin, but it's not. It's a state of being that a person has ended up in because of the actions. Wonderful. Pastor Lambert, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to add um, there is all sin leads to death. And um, in other words, if you do not repent, you will go to hell. Definitely. And there is room for all the sin that we commit to be forgiven. Um, even in First John 2, 1, he said, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if anyone sin, he, have an, he has an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Also said in First John 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the Bible is making it emphatically clear here that it doesn't matter what you have done or what you are doing, you can be forgiven. However, mm -hmm. if you reach that point where you are, as the Bible make mention, um, your conscience becomes seared with a hot iron, it means that nothing would move you or change you anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is a state where you, you are in and people are speaking to you, messages upon messages, and you're just there. And, you know, nothing matters to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? This is where you are at a point of, of a sin unto death because now, because what brings about change in our lives, that's what the Bible said. Um, Jesus speaking, Jesus said, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Additionally, it says, the, 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 the Bible says that the Spirit convicts a man of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. So if the Spirit of God is silent, hmm. you have silent the Spirit over a duration of time based on your practices, then it doesn't matter what people say to you, it wouldn't help you. <laughs> and that's why, I, and the Apostle John says, Do even waste your time and pray. That, that is correct. That is correct, Pastor. I just want to add something further. Someone is asking what was the topic for today. We're just dealing with difficult Bible passages. Um, that's, what, that's what we're dealing with. But um, it's important. You know, Pastor, Noel, sometimes when we talk about um, the unpardonable sin, we really refer to it and talk about it in an evangelistic nature. A person not listening to the preaching of the gospel and they're sort of partying and carnival and all kinds of stuff. But no, you know, when, when this is raised, in fact, the people who most likely commit the unpardonable sin are persons who know Jesus, you know. Yes, because you would have had to have a relationship and knowledge and continually going against what you know. You cannot commit the unpardonable sin without knowing something. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying. You must know. And over a period of time, you keep doing some stuff that you know is wrong, but you continue to do it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm saying we have to be very careful because sometimes we think of the evangelistic kind of thing, you're preaching crusade and folks aren't listening to you. Well, you could be sitting in church, you know 
you, you, are, you are a believer and you continue to do things, this is the Spirit speaking. So we have, I'm saying let's not take comfort. Some of us who, who know Jesus and take comfort. Well, it's, that's not referring to us. That's referring to persons who do not want to get baptized. That, now, this text doesn't refer to that. <laughs> You know, well, Pastor, I'm glad you said that because the context of the text would have us to believe that John is speaking to Christians. Of course, <laughs> of course, that's the point I'm making. Because very often I'm saying we take this text and the one in the Ephesians and, and think that you know it's talking about non-believers who are not listening to preachers. Mm. No, no, this is the John is talking to my little children. He's talking to God's people. Be careful how you handle this because you could reach a point where. People can call for prayers for you, and the prayers will mean nothing. They are, in fact, John is saying, don't even bother us pray, because that prayer would have yeah. been nothing. You have gone too far. Yeah, no, don't waste your time. And, and, and I, I'm glad I like what Pastor Lambert had said, you know, um, in, in reference to um, constantly rejecting and saying no. You know, and um, it is a frightening thing, not just for, as, as Pastor said, for those who have not yet accepted, but it's a frightening thing for us as pastors. You know, sometimes we have a practice that we are holding on to, something that we are doing and we're not changing the Spirit of God speaking to our hearts and we're not heeding the Spirit pleading. And we can get ourselves in that position. You know, anyone. I, 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 yeah, yes, Pastor. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm saying anyone. <laughs> you can find them. Uh, that is the truth. <laughs> you know, so, and that's why we really want our online believers or online audience today, you know, to take this passage at heart and, and really seek to apply what we are saying here today. Uh, and if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, you might be doing something that you know that you should not be doing. We want to encourage you by the grace of God to turn away from it. Because the moment in time you commit that, 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 that act, that particular sin against the Holy Spirit because Pastor, ha Pastor Lambert highlighted that this sin is committed to against the Holy Spirit because it is the Spirit of God that convicts us of sin. And once you, the Spirit of God is silent, well, you're in trouble because you will not even know that you are sinning because he speaks to you no more. And that's why we really want the, our online audience today to make a change, you know. There is hope. God is speaking to you today. You know that what you're supposed to do and what you don't supposed to do. Please do what is right. To the grace of God. Amen. I, I want us to move on to our third question that is really centered around First John chapter 3 and verse 9. As Pastor Enoch highlighted today, we are looking at difficult passages in the scripture. First John chapter 3 and verse 9, and it reads, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Because he has been born of God. Pastors, is it true that a born again Christian cannot sin? Well, um, as we as you basically I think we even touched that that question already. Um this is impossible. Um in terms of by nature we are sinners. Even in the book of Romans chapter chapter Romans chapter eight, it says, um, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Um, and as you continue to read the entire chapter, you will see that there is a, a battle, a back and forth with the flesh and the spirit. Even in, in um, Romans chapter Romans chapter 7, reading from our, our verse, verse 21 down there, and Paul was saying the things that he want to do, he find himself not doing, and the things that he don't want to do, he find himself doing. So it was just a back and forth. Um, that was the struggle that he was experiencing. What the Bible is actually saying there is that when you give your life to Jesus and the Spirit of God um, takes control of you, you now lose the desire to continue, and that's the word, to continue to do the things that, that, the things that do not please God. So this is, this is what, what the Bible is saying there. But along the Christian pathway, we will fall, we will make mistakes, we will, we will slip up. But um, the Bible gives us the assurance, even Jesus speaking through to the, um, the Apostle John, in 1 John 2, 1, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. God's intention for us is not that we continue in sin. But he's saying that if you sin, you have an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he, he, he's, the, the Bible is not saying that if you are a Christian, once you give your life to Jesus, you're perfect, and um, you, 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 you do not make any mistake, you do not sin, no. And we can see many examples in the Bible, through different Bible characters, that they were solid men of God. And they failed. Even um, David was a solid man. He was leading God's people. Uh, and he came back home and he just fell. You know, we, saw, we, we see many, many different examples. And the thing about it, when they fall, God didn't condemn them. 
God reached out to them, they responded positively, they received forgiveness, and they were restored to a relationship with him. Wonderful, of course, of course, um, right on point there, Pastor Paul. Um, the, the, the text, I must admit, <laughs> that you read, Pastor, would, would suggest or uh, insinuate as though once you are coming in contact with Christ, you cannot sin. You, you know, that, that, that the, the, the surface reading mm -hmm. gives that impression. But, um, you know, Romans 3.23 already tells us that, that all have sinned. Yeah. You see? Yeah, yeah the, you know, all have sinned. That, um, addition, additionally, Pastor Paul just mentioned in First, um, First John 2, one, you know, the Apostle John says, you know, I'm, ask, I'm saying to you that, that you shouldn't sin. Mm. And that's, he said, my little children. He's not talking about non-believers. You know? mm -hmm. People who are already in Christ. He said, I'm saying to you, you shouldn't sin. But if you sin, but then if, if, if it is true that a believer couldn't sin, then why would he put it away? So he said, but if you sin, and in fact, some renderings say, when you sin, <laughs> I, you have an advocate in Jesus. Yes? So it is not true. It is not correct to say that a born-again Christian cannot sin. No. In fact, the, 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 the psalmist David, says that we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's, that's, that's how we came into the world. So I like to say it this way. Sin runs in our veins. Mm. No, and that's what it is. You, so if, if the day passes and you couldn't remember that you committed a sin, a practice, of, you know, some, some act of sin, you, you still need to go and ask God to forgive you. And you may say, Pastor, why should I ask God to forgive me? I knew I took a good tally. I didn't lie to you. I didn't steal. I didn't, you know. No, no, it doesn't matter. Because sin in your vein, you still have to ask God to forgive you. And, and someone say, ask, for God to, ask God to forgive me for what? Well, for, for unknown sin. Because the, you may have sinned in thought and didn't realize you have sinned. Different from, well, you, I mean, it's easy to know, well, okay, I didn't steal something today. You know? But you can sin in thought and didn't know that you, are, you have sinned. Because sin runs in the veins. And the only time that would change, mm, the Apostle Paul says, when this mortal shall have put on immortality. Mm. Meaning, at no time before that point, someone can declare, mm. I have arrived, I have become sinless now. No, no, anybody say that they are, they are false. It's only when, in a, the Apostle Paul says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you have seen Jesus, and then the change takes place. Out, until then, we shall sin. But what the Apostle John, I think Pastor Paul mentioned that, is that the Christian cannot continue to practice sin. That's the difference. Yes? So, yes, you fall down you make an, and you, you get back up and you, are, you ask God to forgive, forgive you. But the Christian, being born again, cannot knowingly. You're planning, you're practicing sin. No, 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 no. You have not met Jesus if that's where you're functioning. The Christian can't function like that. Those who are born of God, um, the, the Apostle John is saying, cannot leisurely continue to practice sin because you have you met jesus you can fall and falter along the way and then you'll get back up but it's not in you to just habitually practice sin. that's the difference and that's what the text says um when you are in christ you are a new creature that's right old things are passed away so your old way of thinking and behaving cannot be the same when the seed and it's very critical that the text said the seed is in you, which is Christ, that makes the difference. And so I want to encourage our audience uh, today uh, to be reminded that once you roll in with Christ, the things you used to do yesterday, you won't do it no more. It would not be a practice, but you will be doing the things of God because of who dwells in you. That's what makes the difference. So the, the, the answer here, please understand the answer, and it was clearly highlighted and stated by the two pastors that it is not speaking about um, not committing sin at all. It's talking about the practice. The individual that is born again cannot practice and continue to live in sin. I just want to add, um, mm -hmm. according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 17, um, James 4, 17, sorry, says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is sin. So there is... Other than there is a sin of commission of things that you will do that will be sinful, there is a sin of omission. You might see a situation whereby you can step in and alleviate somebody's pain or suffering, mm. and you refuse to do that. 
and you think, well, I did not do anything wrong, but you refuse to do something right to your sin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Powerful, powerful. At this moment, you know, we're going to just take a break and look at some ad or some events that the Guinea Conference will be having very soon. So please stay tuned and be blessed. Life Department of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists presents GPS God Powered Singles. We are inviting all SDA singles throughout Grenada to join us at the Spice Basket on September 10th, 2022 at 9 a.m. It will be a grand experience as you learn how to maximize your single season, start healthy relationships, and partake in our Get to Know You session. You can't afford to miss this. See you there. Women's Ministries ended now emphasis on Sabbath, August 27th, 2022 under the theme, Abuse of Power. Tune in at our Adventist Youth Service as a panel of women have an informative discussion on the topic. End it now. You don't want to miss it. Stop and pray. Members, leaders, and prayer intercessors, join the prayer ministries of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists for our annual prayer motorcade on Sabbath, 24th September from 9 a.m. The motorcade starts from Shantimal Junction and continues to Marley Junction in Sotez. We break for lunch at the McDonald College and resume the motorcade to Rose Hill, Montreach, and end at Hermitage, all at the historic parish of St. Patrick's. Come with hearts concentrated as we lift the name of Jesus and be blessed with lovely singing, powerful preaching, literature distribution, and fervent intercessory prayers. Remember, it will be a DSAP experience. Drive, stop, and pray. Join us with your buses, cars and vans as we journey through St. Patrick's in gospel ministry, stopping at every point for concentrated periods of ministry, evangelism, and intercession. It will be spiritually impactful. Let's be there. From the Youth Department of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is the Festival of the Arts in an explosion of praise. Join the excitement as talents from across the island are displayed in music, drama, poetry, instrumentals, and the arts. Every district will be represented in this flamboyant symphony of praise. Festival of the Arts. Don't miss it. Thank you so much, my online viewers, for staying tuned with us. We also want to thank you so much for the comments that you have given. We are seeing all the comments. We are seeing the greetings. We appreciate it greatly. And this morning, we're having a wonderful time here discussing difficult passages in the Bible. And so we just want to continue because we have some powerful questions that we want to look at today, especially some difficult questions that we know that you would like answer to. So at this moment, we just want to continue with question four. And I would read First Timothy chapter 2 um, from verse 11. First Timothy chapter 2 from verse 11 to 15. And it reads, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but, be, but to be in silence or be quiet. For, a, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So the question is, pastors, today, doesn't the Bible condemn women speaking in church? Does the Bible condemn women speaking in church all right uh, basically what the bible is saying there is um that's not what the bible is saying the bible is not condemning um women speaking in church so i want to um state that off the bat that the bible is not saying that um however um the society and the culture back then 
in the time of the apostle and so on, a lot of recognition, or most of the recognition, or all of it, were given to men. As a result of that, um, even when you look at the lineage or the genealogy of families, most of them speak about the, the father and they speak about his sons. And sometimes even though you have daughters, the daughters might be mentioned after in another part portion of the scriptures. So we cannot use that to say that God was saying that um, women should not speak in church. Um, Pastor Isaac could enlighten a little more, but I just want to state this. That the time that we are living in, Jesus made it abundantly clear. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23, he says um, that we are one in Christ, right? And as a result of that, there is no Greek, there is no Jew, there is no bond, there is no free, there is no male, there is no female. All of us have equal rights. Additionally, even in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17, he speaks about um, when the Spirit of God comes. The Spirit of God will be fall upon all flesh, and he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Say, young men shall, um, the old men shall dream dreams, and the young men shall see vision. So, in other words, when the Spirit of God fall upon male or female, they have the authority and the privilege to speak. So, when the gift of the Spirit is being distributed, they're not saying the gift is not held back from a, um, a gender, uh, specifically speaking from a woman, because she doesn't have the right to speak. The Bible doesn't teach her, because you see many examples in the Bible where women receive the gift of prophecy, and that is to speak on behalf of God. Powerful, powerful, Pastor, you know. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, of course, um, so with that, I probably took off my mic and didn't realize it. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes things the Bible sometimes the Bible says certain things and um we take it as doctrine. I think that that's one of them. Persons, there's one passage that we can find in the whole of the Bible. And clearly when that happens, Pastor Noel, we have to evaluate what is it? Why is why is isn't it that the Bible is saying that several other places? You see? If it's a doctrine, it can't be just mentioned one place. Um, so clearly, in this passage that you, you, you read, um, the Apostle Paul is addressing a matter. And as Pastor Paul rightly said, um, this, we, we've seen through the Bible where several women, oh, prophets and prophetess and speaking for God. But in this scenario, it's clear that there's a problem there. So the Apostle Paul says, I do not permit. <laughs> I do not permit. He's dealing with an issue. You, you see, he's addressing an issue. And um, in that context, there, there, are so <laughs> there are some women who are very powerful. Yeah. I will add, too powerful. Mm -hmm. So what they were doing was usurping the power. In, the, in that context, there, the men were the ones who had the power. Mm -hmm. And they were usurping the power. You know, the Apostle Paul is trying to bring some order and decency in the house of God. Oh. You see, that's what he's trying to do. Yeah. Because there's confusion in the house of God. So he's saying, to manage this thing, here what I'll do. All, my pronouncement is that, it's not a doctrine. My pronouncement in this situation is that all those women who have all these questions to ask and they don't understand, wait, come to church, listen well. When you get back home, ask your husbands. You see? Because he's trying to manage the situation. Who thinks they are poor and who could answer in church? He's saying, take it easy. But what's about all the women who are not married? No, the command is for women who, who have questions and issues, who have husbands. When they get home, they ask their husbands. So it is not a general pronouncement for all women because there are several persons in church who are not married, several young persons, who, which husband they have to ask. So the Apostle Paul is not mandating, he's not condemning women speaking in the church. And Apostle Paul made allusion to that. When the Spirit gives the gift, the, there is no way in the Bible where the Spirit says, this, where the Bible says the Spirit will give gifts to men. No, the Spirit gives gifts to whomever he chooses. So if the Holy Spirit decides, to the, I'm giving the gift of teaching or healing or, or, or exhortation to women, the church, and nobody can say, no, 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 the spirit, you can't give to women. No, no, we can't say that. We don't have the authority because the spirit gives whomever he chooses. That's what the word of God says. And it's for the edification of the church. So if women are capable in this congregation to edify the church, the spirit will give women the gifts to edify the church. You see? So this passage does not condemn. 
Uh, I know there are in many quarters, there are some persons who hold on to this, mm -hmm. and they are very upset that women have the power to speak. Mm -hmm. But women have the power to speak as men has the power to speak because God has given them the power to speak. Wonderful. You see? Wonderful. wonderful. I, I'm so happy that you have and Pastor Lambert have explained so powerfully and so clearly. And I think this is a moment of learning for us today that when it comes to difficult passages, we need to take it into context. And also we need to follow the principle, precepts on precepts. Because Pastor, you rightly said that there's only one passage that speaks about that, which does not give us the authority to build a doctrine. That's right. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to difficult passages, online viewers, you know, you need to take everything into context. You need to also understand that there is a culture where certain things were said. And there and then you can see that it was a particular situation that Paul was dealing with today. So may God bless you in, in understanding that particular question that we have just answered. Now let me move to another question, which is really profound and relevant for us today. And it's taken from... First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. And it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep. <laughs> those who sleep in Jesus. And the question is, if the righteous do not go to heaven when they die, whom will Jesus bring with him when he comes the second time? Have mercy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, Pastor Noel, this is a very tricky um, statement there because the text you just read seemed to suggest mm. that Jesus, who, when he comes the second time, when he's coming through, um, when he leaves the throne room, with him would be hundreds or maybe thousands of saints because mm -hmm. it says whom Jesus would bring with him. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and so there is this doctrine which says, when the righteous die, they go straight to heaven. You, we, heard, we heard that allusion in funerals, and, and yeah. according to what funeral service you go, uh, God forbid that it's, it's, it's not a funeral <laughs> conducted by a seven Adventist minister. Mm. Because you, you hear those things, mm. um, Auntie, I know you're in a better place, you know, mm. looking down upon us. Oh, mercy. Mm. Well, the, the casket is in the church, and the person is there, but they're saying that the person is looking down. Mm -hmm. Well, to look down, you must be a, a, above. Mm -hmm. So they're suggesting, though that casket is, casket is in the church, and the, the person is lying there, but, but, but I don't know. Somehow this, something has gone to heaven, and the person is not looking down upon them. And um, it, it's so false. It's, it's a doctrine from the pit of hell. I mean, we're not really discussing that doctrine today, but it's just, the, the, you remember that family member is crying that the person has died. The person has died. They're crying in church, and at the same time, they say the person is looking down. Well, they shouldn't cry because the person is in heaven, you see? Of course. So, um, but, you know, the Bible tells us what happens when someone dies. The Bible says in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 that the process, what happens, then the dust returns to the, the earth as gave it. And the spirit returns to God. When someone dies, there are two things that happen. The dust, the body, that's where we bury the the, the, the the corpse, the remains of that person, mm -hmm. because it came from the dust. That's after many years. It doesn't matter if you go in a concrete or you go to the, the, the dust, the, actually the, the, the earth, it will turn back into dust. And the spirit, the breath of life, the bread that we breathe, is no longer in the person. So it goes back to God. That's what goes back to God. The Bible doesn't say that the, the person goes to God. So um, the answer to that question is in the, the following verse of, um, you know, um, Thessalonians 4. Yeah, so maybe you can read for us, Pastor. The, 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 we, you read verse 14. Yeah. But uh, if you read verse 15, 16, and 17, I mean, is, is, is there? Uh, before, you, before you read it, I just mm -hmm. want to um, add to some substance to what you just said. Um, when someone dies, the Bible says here clearly in Job, in Job chapter 14 and verse 14, it says, If a man die, Shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. And that's the change in First um, Corinthians 15, um, 51 to 53, uh, 55 going right down there. But, right? but, but, Additionally, but, 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 what's the text? 
are they waiting in the grave or are they waiting in heaven? Well, I, I go in and put that in okay, right okay, there. Okay, you okay. won't answer that. Okay. I don't <laughs> want to take chance to answer that next thing somebody <laughs> wants to debate against me. And in Job chapter 17 and verse 13, Job is saying, if I wait, the grave is my house. So he is waiting. He said he will wait until his change come in Job 14, 14. And then he's saying, if I wait, or oh, while I am waiting, he said, the, the grave shall be my house in Job chapter 17 and verse 13. So nobody is going up there. Everybody has to wait. Yes. And Job makes it emphatically clear that we are waiting in, our, in the grave. Wonderful. Right, so Praise you can God. go ahead with the, with yes, the text. Well, let, me, let me crown it off by reading um, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of God, that we, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will, be, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, which is the righteous, the dead in Christ, will rise for us. That's right. So the term, the, the phrase that Christ, those Christ will bring with him, is, is really referring to those who he will resurrect. Yes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, not that when you die, you go to heaven, you, you're someplace under the throne room, mm -hmm. <laughs> and when Jesus is coming, he's taking you from heaven and coming back to earth with you. No, no, no. That's not correct. That's a doctrine comes from the pit of hell, which says to the person, you go, to, you go straight to heaven, and if you're not so good, you go to a place called purgatory, mm -hmm. where you shall be made good. You know, yeah, it's, uh, it's all kind of tab doctrine. You know? it's, it's a demonic yeah. kind of doctrine. Um, so persons hold on to that. Um, yet still, they're crying. The loved ones are crying. If my father dies and he goes straight to heaven, why am I crying? Mm. He was already there. Exactly. You see? So it, it is not so. Nobody. It doesn't matter if they're good, if they live a, a, a good Christian life or not. Everyone goes to the grave and wait, as, the, as Job says, at the appointed time. Right? So that refers to the persons whom Christ would resurrect, you know, um, at his coming. Not those, who, he's not bringing persons from heaven with him. Yeah? Powerful, powerful. And I just wanted to highlight to our online audience, you know, the importance in making sure that your life is in right order. Making sure that you are connected to him. Because it's only those who are connected with him and died in him, he will resurrect from the grave. All right. As we move on today, we're going to look at this question. Um, the, the text for the question is Acts chapter 10 and verse 13. And I'm just going to read it and then give you the question. A voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Does the Bible clearly teach that Christians can eat whatever food they desire, heart desire? Let me say it again. <laughs> Does the Bible clearly teach that Christians can eat whatever foods their heart so desire based on Acts chapter 10 and verse 13, Peter experience? Pastor, the Bible does not teach that. That sounds as though some persons want to do what they want. They figure it's their time now. You know, they want to eat what they want and do what they want. So they're taking the text to say, the, you know, the, the text says, Peter, kill and eat. Kill frog, eat frog. Kill snake, eat snake. Anything you want, kill and eat. No, the Bible is not saying that. In fact, the answer to that question, Pastor Noel, is um, we read verse, um, what verse, uh, verse 13. Mm -hmm. The same chapter, the answer is in verse 28, you know. Verse 28, yeah. Pastor, probably you should read that. Mm -hmm. Because um, um, read it and then I'll, you know, well, just yes, read it. Let me read it. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with, with wit or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Yeah, that's right. Peter, Peter was in this vision, in this trance, and God was using a situation to teach Peter something. So I'm saying, Pastor Noel, when we study the Word of God, we, I mean, you can't just, I mean, you can't just, I, I think we have a habit of, today we have um, in the news media, folks just read a, take a line or something and they take that and they say that, you know, that was said by the Prime Minister or that was said. They're not reading the story. They're not listening to everything. It's the same thing people do to the Bible. They just take a text and they're not reading the story as though we, as though we don't have time. Or maybe we, we, we are very malicious. We know what 
or probably the Bible will tell us the right thing, so we refuse to read it, mm -hmm. Pastor Paul. So, so here God is trying to teach Paul as a Jew. And because the Jewish nation had that kind of um, insularity with themselves and, and, and everybody else, the Gentiles, you know, and God was teaching Peter a lesson, mm. you know. So when he says, kill and eat, even Peter knew that because Peter said, I can't do that, Lord, because I, I have never eaten anything common and clean, but God is leading Peter to somewhere. And then, I mean, we don't have time here, but then thereafter, God revealed what, what he was really teaching Peter. And then Peter responded in verse 28, oh, God has shown me that I should not call anyone common or unclean. Yes? So it wasn't referring to killing something, an animal, and eat it. God was using that vision to explain something greater to Peter. And, and, and I think that the message is, is therein contained um, that um, we, we have to be careful how we read the, the scripture and how we interpret the scripture to our own fancy. Because very often, I think a lot of church leaders, lot, I think they do it maliciously, Pastor, believe me, that, that the word of God is there and... and, and examples are there and, and the answers to certain questions are there. But folks are not reading that, Pastor. They're not reading that. They're preaching what they want to preach. You know? Um, you listen to some preachers and they don't, they don't preach nothing about revelation. I mean, nothing. It's there. You wonder if that's part of the Bible. Mm. They're preaching nice little things like planting seed and sowing seed and, and, and making nonsense to themselves. And people are accepting that. So I'm saying very often the Word of God, you know, the Bible answers the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes? In the Bible, you, and but folks don't. Folks choose not to read it sometimes. Pastor Lamujato, anything to add? All right, just mm -hmm. quickly. Um, you can just read that story for yourself. You know, it's it's really clear. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I what I really like about it is that while Peter was in the dream, it happened three times. Mm -hmm. After that, they call Peter. They say, Peter, three men standing at the gate. Mm -hmm. So it happened three times, and then three men were standing at the gate. And while Peter was going with them. Peter wouldn't normally do that. Peter said, God had showed me in verse 28. Right? So you see, it clearly has nothing to do with what we should eat or what we shouldn't eat. And if you want to know what to eat or what you shouldn't eat, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 says, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, it should be to the glory of God. All right? And there are things that the Bible stated clearly in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, and Isaiah 66, 15 to 17 that we should and should not eat. Thank you. Wonderful. Pastors, I'm really grateful, you know, for the steps, you know, that you have given unto me today in how to dissect passages that is difficult. And once again, we are seeing another example of what we need to do when we come across difficult passages, especially if it is found in a chapter that you need to read the entire chapter. You can just take out one text out of its context and make a doctrine, but you need to read the entire passage that so wrongs the passage, and then you will get the answer. Thank you so much, pastors, for that. You know, that's clarity. Uh, as we move on, I want to jump into John chapter 20 and verse 23 because our time is quickly running off. John chapter 20 and verse 23, it says, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Uh, and the question is, why does your church teach only Jesus can forgive sins? Didn't Jesus also give such power to the church before he left earth? <laughs> well, I do not know that, Pastor. That you just <laughs> There's only one person, the Bible says in um, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess our sins, he, he, he is the antecedent of what was said before, meaning it is if he refers to the person whom John was talking about before, which, and John was talking about Jesus. Yeah. All through the word of God, there is no group of persons which can forgive sins. We've never, uh, well, I've never seen that. I haven't seen anything like that. I, I've seen the Bible talk about God. I mean, there has been debate in the Bible if Jesus was God, you know, some of the Jews, yeah, but it's always referred to God. Forgiveness of sins relate to God. So, so first John said that, in fact, in fact, the Jews themselves in, in, um, in Mark, Mark 2, 7 says, why does this man does speak blasphemies? Yeah. Who can forgive sin but God only? only God. So even the Jews knew that only God can forgive sins. Now, there's a doctrine, Pastor Noel, which, which is built from this text you just read, the, um, which seem, seem to indicate that the church and persons, powerful people in the church, have authority to forgive sins. 
And if they choose not to forgive the sins, well, that's it. You know, the Roman church has such doctrine that, that certain um, church leaders are given the prerogative by the church leader to forgive sins. And if they choose not to forgive that sin, well, as we would say, as old, you know, say, you ever heard that term, Pastor? Crap who smoke your pipe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Meaning, if, you, if, if your sins are not forgiven by these church leaders, forget that, you know. In trouble. Yeah, you can't make it to the kingdom. But this passage, Pastor um, Noel, it can be related back to the passage in, in Matthew um, 16, 18, where Jesus gives certain authority to the church. Yes? But that authority excludes minus forgiveness of sin. The church doesn't have that authority. Mm -hmm. No, as a church leader, I do not have that authority to forgive people. I need forgiveness. I don't have that authority. But the church has certain authority in making decisions on behalf of Christ once it's done properly. Mm -hmm. Jesus said to Peter, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom to preach. The keys of the kingdom is not the, the keys or the, you know, that's how the, the, the Roman church has it. As though Peter was the first pope and he has the keys. So if he says, I'm not forgiving you, you're not going to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. The keys of the kingdom does not mean that. The keys of the kingdom is the gospel. You have the authority to preach the everlasting gospel and that's why we should preach the gospel. Yeah. Despite what people say, we should preach the gospel because that's what people will get to know about the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. So if you choose not to preach the gospel, you know, you're locking, in a sense, you're locking the kingdom against some persons. Mm -hmm. So the keys of the kingdom is the proclamation, the ability, and the truth that we have to preach the everlasting gospel. And the church in its administration can make certain decisions relative to certain persons, administrative decisions. Mm -hmm. But those decisions, I, I repeat myself, does not entail the church having the authority to forgive sins. All of us who are church leaders have to ask God to forgive us our sins. We don't possess that authority. Only God can forgive sin. So any church, any ecclesiastical body that claims to have such authority, and they are who have claimed, that erroneous teaching, this text does not say that. This text talks about the administ administrative. And by the way, Pastor, there is no other text in the Bible hmm. that talks about that. That's the only text that. And that, we come back to that point again. So if one text is saying something, mm -hmm. you need to find out what, you know, what, what, what's really the meaning because there is no other New Testament or Old Testament passage that talks mm -hmm. about um, um, the church or the church leaders having the ability to forgive sins. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful, Pastor. Pastor Lambert, you want nothing to say about that? I'm well, good I, with that, yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, even, even um, the, the, the verse before that, which is John chapter 20 and verse 22, and he said, when he had said, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So in, in essence, not even just the administration by themselves, but an administration empowered by the Holy Spirit. That does that act on the behalf of God. Yes, so. and, and but that act does not entail forgiveness. No, forgiveness no, of sin. no. <laughs> you see, it's authority to make certain decisions. That is correct. Wonderful. As we quickly move on to question eight, it says, "Has it been? It has been said on many occasions that the soul is not a living entity outside the body. If that is to be accepted, how would you explain First Kings chapter seventeen?" Um, from verse 21 to 22. And let me just read First Kings 17, 21 to 22. And it says, And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. Yeah, um, we we out of time here, but you know, Genesis two seven says what happened when when God breathed into God created Adam. He breathed into that 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 um that that being mm. that 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 model, you know <laughs> that he made, and and he breathed into his nostril, and the 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 that being became a living soul. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what happens at, at at when he created Adam. We talked about what happened when, when in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, when the breath leaves, what happens to man? So that word, that soul, is, is, the, the, is, is a Hebrew word that is, is, is um, used for that, nephesh, which really means life. Yeah, it has been used over 700 times in the Old Testament um, and has been translated about 117 times 
into the word life. So when, when Elijah stretched himself upon the boy, the child, and he says his soul came back. The soul, what pastor many persons believe and teach is that the soul is a living entity. So your soul can leave you. Like now, you're sitting there. <laughs> they teach your soul can leave you and do what is called astral travel. It can travel. And you're sitting here talking to us and your soul has left you. No, no. Our soul is not a living entity. Right? Sitting up here, there are three souls. One here, one here. That's, that's the soul. That's the soul. Not, we can't live. Our soul can't live. And these are the souls. Living souls. And, and when the Bible says the soul of the child came back, meaning it really meant the life came back into the child. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's the, 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 the Hebrew word there. Translated, also translated life. So um, it's not something that left the child, went away, and then Elijah breathed, and then that thing came back into the child. Mm -hmm. What came back is the breath of life that God gave. Powerful. You see? So um, that's what it really means. In, in a nutshell, we know our time is, mm -hmm. is running away, but that's what it, it means in a nutshell, that um, we are living souls, and if, we, if the breath of life should leave us, um, we, be, we, are, we, in a, we are dead souls. Dead Wonderful, wonderful. So the word can be interchangeable. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it, 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 that's wisdom, Pastor Enoch. You, know. you know, to conclude our, our session today, we want to ask this final question. Is it true that dogs are the only animals that will not enter the kingdom of God? And this is taken from Revelation chapter 22. Pastor, Pastor Lambert, I want you to answer that. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15, and it says, But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and adulterers, and whoever loves and practice a lie. All right, so that's a very um, interesting scripture. It's, speak, it's speaking about persons who will not enter the kingdom of God. And um, you see the, the term the dogs uh, is apparent that the, the group of people or the group of characters there ties in with an animal. But how does that have a place there? Um, <laughs> if we look at Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 15, and, and I want to share that scripture, Matthew chapter 15 and... Um, Reading from verse 25. And it says here, it says in verse 25, Then came she, that's a woman, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She came to Jesus, but he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Mm. Basically, this woman, she was not a Jew. And the Jew had a tendency to um, call the people who are, not, um, who are not Jews to call them dogs. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus said, It is not meat to take the children's bread because when he came he said he come to call his people first mm -hmm. the jews and because the jews refused him then he opened up the entire invitation because the bible makes it clear um in galatians chapter 3 and verse 30 that salvation is of the jew yeah. right so he says here um it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs and she continued with the same statement accepting her position yeah. she said and she said truth lord Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. So Jesus was calling the woman, based on the cultural practice, a dog. But the woman really wanted to experience Jesus. Mm -hmm. And after that, now he told her, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. And she had an experience with him. So the, the term dog, there is not the animal dog, but the practice. People who, who deviate from the things of God. People who do not show any interest in the things of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Powerful, powerful. Pastor, you want to run? Yeah, I just want to, um, just to back up that point, Pastor mm -hmm. Paul just made in Isaiah 56, 10 um, to 12, um, the prophet said, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. Mm. They are all dumb dogs. <laughs> they cannot back, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yet they are greedy dogs. Mostly. That's referring to human beings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So dogs is a category of persons whom the Bible refers to as, in this case, in Isaiah, those, those preachers and, and, and ministers mm. who knowingly mislead people, the Bible mm. calls them dogs. Mm -hmm. So John is also saying, outside are dogs. Mm. Not, not, Jesus didn't die for dogs. No, listen to me. When Jesus Christ comes, Come on the now. only dog, the only animals that there will be in the kingdom is, dog, is animals that God created. <laughs> Meaning new animals. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. Not, but, but, but we human beings will have to be saved. Animals doing, I will, a lion eat someone, mm -hmm. a lion don't have to give you a conch for that. Exactly. No, all lions will burn. If there are lions in the earth, God will create them. Mm -hmm. So this group, this term dog refers to person, despicable characters who knowing what the word of God says, still 
choose to do otherwise. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much, Pastor Enoch and Pastor Paul, you know, for joining us here this morning to share your insight on difficult passages. I hope uh, you learn a lot today, and I pray by the grace of God that you put into practice everything that was taught and given. I just want to remind you that you can join on for our Friday evening uh, Youth Live Unplug and even our Sabbath program that continues at start at 9 o'clock on, on, on morning and continue to follow us right here uh, on our Sunday evening programs as well and we continue our pastoral corner on Tuesday um, from 11.30. We are tremendously blessed by your presence today and we thank you so much for joining us and we pray that each and every one of you will continue to have a solid relationship with Jesus by studying his word intimately on a daily basis. At this moment I would just ask Pastor Enoch to just close up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being here today to share your word with your people throughout. We thank you for the clarity you brought through the discussion of your word. And now as we're about to leave, where your Holy Spirit dismisses us as we prepare yet again um, for another pastor's corner. Dismiss us with your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Farewell and blessing to each one of you. <laughs>